Hi, it's Penny here, and this is going to be a very late June wrap up. So in June, we were getting ready to move and doing a whole bunch of pre-moving stuff, which definitely affected my reading. Although I did still read 15 things during the month of June. It's a bit of a trick though, because nine of those were graphic type things. So they were a lot easier to get through and perfect for my like overwhelmed brain in the month of June. And I like only read six more full novel things, although a lot of those were also very long, so I don't feel too bad about it. Mm, maybe some of those were short as well. Anyway, I did read some things that I really loved, also some things I didn't, but some things that I really loved. So let's get into it. Uh, I will be doing this book battle style as I always do, which means I pair up all the books and I battle them against each other until we come up with the best book of the month. So let's start with our first battle. We are going to have Renegade's Magic by Robin Hobb up against The Trouble with Peace by Joe Abercrombie. So Renegade's Magic is the third book in the Soldier Sun trilogy by Robin Hobb. Uh, I always point out that this is a book trilogy not in her bigger Realm of the Elderlings and weirdly has a much lower average rating than the Realm of the Elderlings even though I feel like there are a lot of similarities with especially the earlier Fitz books and I really don't understand why people who like that series wouldn't like this one except that maybe the fantasy setting is a little bit less traditional and there are maybe a few uh, challenging themes. So this is set in kind of an alternate colonial America. Uh, Navarre's people are the colonizers and there's kind of a couple of different native peoples that they are coming into conflict with. I always feel that sounds a bit weak, but uh, this really gets into the complexity of the situation. Navarre ends up in a position where he's able to see both sides and also see how difficult it's going to be to find a good solution, even though he does also end up in a position where he has to try. The magic in this is also, I think, really good in the way that it represents his lack of control, in the way that the magic really just uses people to do what it wants to do, rather than people specifically using the magic. And personally, I just really love how the plot was interwoven with the themes. I I do think that maybe I don't agree with everything that was being presented in this book, but I still definitely think it makes you think and is, is worth the read for that. Uh, another thing I think a lot of people don't like about this book is the theme of uh, fat phobia. So there is a lot of fat phobia in this book series, which is definitely something to be aware of going into it, but I also think the representation is so great. And again, it links into those, those themes about having a lack of control. And as you would expect from Robin Hobb, this was super emotional. I guess as well, uh, it's super slow, which is another thing you would expect from Robin Hobb. But I really love this. The only thing I maybe didn't like was the very ending where things felt just a little bit convenient and I wasn't really sure that it connected in as well with the themes but this definitely made me feel things and think things and I just had a great time with it so if you love the realm of the elderlings I still think this trilogy is definitely worth a try. Then we have The Trouble with Peace by Joe Abercrombie so this is the second book in the Age of Madness trilogy which is kind of the second trilogy in his bigger first law world. I really liked the first trilogy and I'm struggling with the second trilogy primarily because it's very low fantasy. Uh, there is not a lot, if any, magic going on. So it's really just this really grim dark story of the Industrial Revolution. Joe Abercrombie always writes things where the characters do terrible things and things always go wrong for them. And so even though I like the character, Joe Abercrombie also always great at writing very likeable characters. I don't know that I feel invested in their story, but I have to admit, his writing is still amazing. He has some uh, just great lines where he really captures the essence of the awfulness of the world. And even though it's very dark, it's also very humorous. And I did really appreciate the ending of this book, actually. Um, I found in a lot of ways it was kind of predictable, but also kind of shocking. And that is very impressive to pull off. And it did definitely make me interested to see that where things will go in the third book. So I'm liking it. I just wish there was a little bit more magic in this story. So if I'm putting these two books up against each other, I am definitely going to pick Renegade's Magic just because there is more magic and just because I felt more emotionally connected and maybe because I felt generally more 
hopeful after reading this one. And then for our next battle we have Monstrous Volumes 5 to 8 by Marjorie Lou and Sana Takeda up against When Amongst Crows by Veronica Roth. Normally in these battles I try to have some connection. The only connection between these two is that they both have beautiful art. So starting with Monstrous, earlier in the year I reread volumes 1 to 4 in preparation for volume 8 coming out. Uh, it took me a long time though to get my hands on volume 8 from the library but it finally arrived and so I reread volumes 5 to 7 in preparation and as always I understood the plot a lot better than I did in previous reads. I actually don't know that I've reread volumes 5 to 7 before and I kind of think I probably need to again. Uh, so this is set in this world where we have these ancient gods that have these animal type appearances uh, and also the race of children that they have had with the humans. There's a lot of different political factions and wars going on and a lot of like magical manipulation and corruption going on. Mainly our main character is this girl named Micah who has this demon inside her that sometimes comes out and eats people. Her and this adorable fox girl are just like going around trying to figure out how to make things better and figure out what's going on. It's, it's a lot more complicated than that but it's hard to describe partly because it's complicated but also because I don't know that I fully understand it. So then I finally got to volume 8 and I have to say volume 8 was a lot of like was it dreams? Was it another dimension? I don't know but it didn't actually make a lot of sense to me and I also didn't think the art was quite as good. Like still good, still good because Sana Takeda is amazing but not as good as some of the previous volumes. So like I liked it but it was a little bit of a disappointment to be honest and only because my expectations were super high. So I'm hoping that the next volume, because there will be a next volume, I'm hoping that will kind of get better again. And once again when volume 9 comes out I'll probably do a reread all over again and try to once again see if I can understand the plot better. So then we have When Among Crows by Veronica Roth. Uh, Veronica Roth of course being well known for her Divergent series although I think she's written a few other things since then. I haven't read any of them but I was sucked in by the beautiful cover of When Among Crows because it is really beautiful and the, the contents is actually really beautiful too. We're primarily following this man who is getting involved with the supernatural world in I've forgotten the town now uh, but all the supernatural creatures in this world are Polish mythology inspired and I don't know much about Polish mythology but uh, from the author's note I can see that Veronica Roth has some Polish ancestry that she was wanting to explore through the story and I really liked it. It's kind of a lot of different vampires that feed on emotions and the way that that kind of fit in with the emotional journey of the different characters I thought was quite well done and just in general that writing was very atmospheric in a way that I did like. The only time I didn't like it is that in some of the action scenes I think it felt very hard to follow the action because of the writing style but the main strength of the story really was those character journeys and the emotions that are being expressed while also having kind of this cool Polish supernatural foundation and I really liked it. Um, I, I just a few times I felt like the writing wasn't quite doing what it wanted to do and I think that's not that it wasn't good it was just that I felt like it had the potential to be better. Again maybe that's me having unrealistic expectations. Anyway if I am putting like Monstrous Volume 8, let's just do 8 which was the new one, uh, Monstrous Volume 8 up against When Amongst Crows I would definitely pick When Amongst Crows because it was a much clearer story and I really liked how Veronica Roth uh, use the the Polish mythology. Then we have a couple of weird ones. We have The Memory Theatre by Karen Tidbeck up against Tidal Creatures by Sean and Maguire. So firstly uh, The Memory Theatre by Karen Tidbeck. This was a five star prediction for me that really didn't work out. It follows uh, these young people who live in this garden where the adults are always kind of having luxurious parties and every day they forget everything that's happened before but they're also uh, very violent and the deal is that when these children get to adulthood they will be killed so they would really like to escape and an opportunity comes for them to do that by leaving that world and coming to I feel like the back of the book said our world but 
I, I don't know that it was exactly our world, but maybe it was because there were references to like World War II or something. I really wanted to love this book and it started out with this very fairy tale Alice in Wonderland feeling. There were a lot of references that I felt almost made it into an Alice in Wonderland retelling, but then it just did some really strange things and I never felt like I knew what the point of the story was. It seemed like the kind of story where everything should be a metaphor for something but I couldn't work out what the metaphor was and I read an interview with Karen Tidbeck and she seemed to be kind of saying that it wasn't a metaphor for anything and so then I just don't know if there even was a point. There were parts that I really loved. Um, one of the adult characters, we get their perspective and they're so murderous that I kind of loved it. They're like so indignant that people aren't giving them enough respect and they just see nothing wrong with murdering people and it was kind of fun. What does that say about me? I don't know. But I kind of liked the vibes, but in the end, I didn't know what the story was about. So that was disappointing. <laughs> Then we have Title Creatures by Shawnee Maguire. So this is the third book in the Alchemical Journeys series, the first book being Middle Game, which I absolutely loved. The second one was Seasonal Fears, which I absolutely hated and thought was completely pointless and stupid. Uh, the third one, Title Creatures, I guess kind of in the middle. So we're following a bunch of manifestations of different moon goddesses, moon goddesses from all sorts of different cultures around the world, and they regularly travel to the Impossible City, which is set up in the previous books as this kind of alchemical homeland, let's say, and the alchemists of our world would really like to take it over, but they have no way to access it. And so in this book, they are have some different schemes going on where they attempt to use these moon goddesses, oh, moon gods, there's some moon gods as well, not just goddesses, um, they attempt to use them to get access to the impossible city and we're following basically these moon gods and goddesses as they deal with these alchemists. It all gets very metaphysical and I love some of the concepts but the plot just moves so slowly and I don't think that like in the first book not only was there some amazing character development there was also like a really great plot that was I guess it was also slow but it was balanced with that character journey. In the third book it's slow but also there's not enough of a character journey to fill in the gaps and just it didn't do enough still but it was an okay read. I had an okay time. I still think Shauna Maguire is in her earlier books that I really liked like some of the earlier Wayward Children books and also Middle Game. She does include a lot of digressions where she goes off into different kind of social commentary type bits and I felt like those were linked in so well to the story whereas in her later books I feel like she's still trying to do a lot of digressions into social commentary but they don't link well into the story so it feels just very unfocused and unclear what point she's even trying to make or at least that's how it feels to me. Anyway though, if I'm putting it up against the memory theatre, you know, I actually think it was still better because at least I knew what the story was about. So we'll put title creatures through to the next round. Okay, then the next couple of battles are mostly the graphic things I read, but I've included one book because this next battle is going to be the sci-fi books I read, even though title creatures is kind of sci-fi, but Anyway, the rest of the sci-fi books I read. So we have Far Sector by N.K. Jemisin, Up Against The Children of Men by P.D. James, Up Against Remina by Junji Ito. So Far Sector, I mainly picked this up because it was written by N.K. Jemisin and obviously the art is done by someone, I can't remember the name, but I'll try and put it, I'll put the cover here. Uh, I also didn't really realise because I'm not that into general superhero comics that this is a Green Lantern comic. If I had known that maybe I wouldn't have picked it up but actually it didn't really matter uh, even though there was some talk throughout it about her Green Lantern powers not being exactly like the normal Green Lantern powers and I saw some people in the reviews on Goodreads criticising that. Didn't mean anything to me because I don't know anything about that. What I really did love about this is the world building. Um, we have these different races. Now please forgive me because it's been a while since I read this and it was before we moved and everything is different now so my brain barely remembers those times but there's like one group of people that are kind of digital and their names all start with at and they call themselves the at ats I think and they like what we learn about them throughout throughout the book is just really interesting and there's also oh the main thing about this book is that the people on this planet 
don't feel emotions. However, there is now a drug that allows them to like turn off the block on their emotions. And then there's a lot of uh, political battles going on about whether that is something that should be allowed. And you can definitely see there's a lot of parallels into a lot of American politics at the moment. So as well, I think some people said they felt like it was a little bit on the nose because of those parallels with American politics. I'm not from America, so I maybe sometimes it was, but also in some parts there were some really good lines. And I also think often these kind of comics are targeted at a younger audience. And when you're younger, sometimes you just need to be told because you haven't had a chance to learn things yet. Uh, the other thing I should say about this comic series is that the art was really beautiful. The color palette that they chose just everything I would want from a comic. There were maybe some bits where it was a little bit slow and I think as well because this is a bind up of a bunch of individual comics, quite often at the beginning of a new comic there would be a, a wrap up of what had happened previously and because I was reading it in one go that got a little bit tedious but that's just a format thing really. Uh, so I really like this. Um, I think if you like N.K. Jemisin's world building then you will probably like this too. Uh, then we have The Children of Men by P.D. James. So I primarily was interested in this because I watched the movie that I think came out in the 80s or 90s. I watched it when I was younger. Uh, basically it's set in a world where humans have become infertile and there are no more children. The oldest child has just turned 18 and humanity is really struggling with the fact that there are just not going to be any more young people. And I just, in the beginning, I really loved the descriptions of this like disintegration of civilization and the way that different people were adapting to the situation. And at first I actually thought this whole book was going to be written as journal entries by the main character and it was the journal entries that I liked a lot better as he like was just making observations about what was happening in the world. But then we did also get uh, a third person narration of things that he was doing. Um, there's a bit of a nonsense political situation and this faction that's trying to change the way that Britain is being managed and all of that that I didn't really like it. I think as well it was trying to make a lot of references to the Bible and the birth of Jesus and I'm not Christian so I probably didn't get most of that but also I really don't care. So unfortunately even though I started out by really just loving the idea and the concept of this I think I like the movie better. Now it has been a while since I watched the movie so maybe I'm wrong with that but in the end I didn't really like it which was a shame. Uh, and then another one I didn't really like is Ruminant by Junji Ito. So I really loved some Junji Ito. I think you can see Uzumaki just on the bottom of the screen there on my bookshelves. Uzumaki I love. There's other things by Junji Ito that I have really loved. But Ruminant is about this uh, other planet that gets discovered that just like moves around erratically and whenever it comes near another planet it just destroys it and then uh, it ends up coming towards Earth and we kind of have people's reactions to that. Uh, also Remina has been named after the scientist that discovered Remina, uh, his daughter, and people kind of are making this weird connection between the two. A lot of that felt like Junji just rehashing a lot of the stuff from his book Tomie and I didn't like any of that. I did find some of the stuff about Remina the planet interesting but it was such a small part of the story and I kind of wish that the end of Remina had been almost where he started because most of what was in the book was stupid. Like didn't like it. Definitely the worst Junji Ito that I've read which is super disappointing. So if I'm putting these three books up against each other I think it's pretty clear that I'm gonna pick Far Sector by N.K. Jemisin. And then lastly we have a bunch of cute graphic type things that I read mainly just because I read them at the end of the month when I had absolutely zero brain power and they were all great for that. So we have Karen's Sleepover by Katie Farina, Up Against Everyone's an Alien When You're an Alien 2 by John Neeson, Up Against The Dream Factory by Steph Mataku. So firstly Karen's Sleepover, this is just another graphic novel adaptation of the Babysitter's Club Little Sister series. I really loved the Babysitter's Club books when I was a kid and I did also read I think when I was very young a few of the Little Sister ones. I don't think I ever read the original Karen's Sleepover but 
I picked up this one. They're always just kind of fun, nostalgic times for me because that series was so big for me when I was a kid. And I'm trying to remember if I had any particular thoughts about it other than it was just cute and fun. Oh, I do remember. This is another one of these ones where the kids are really cliquey and they'll pick out, like, it's kind of a story or it's trying to make out like it's a story about friendship and caring about people, but then they'll pick, like, one girl to be like, oh, she's a piece of shit and we don't like her. And <laughs> it just always seems like it doesn't realize that that doesn't fit with the rest of the messaging. And like, if your friend is acting like a dick, but you should still believe in them being a good person, then surely if another person is being a dick, you should also at least be open to the idea that they might still be a good person. Anyway, I just didn't know how I felt about the message of this. And because these are designed for really young kids, and a lot of it is about teaching them lessons through a cute story, um, I didn't know how I felt about that lesson. That's how I felt about that one. But other than like the lesson side of things, cute, fun, good times. Uh, then I read Everyone's an Alien When You're an Alien 2. This is just super cute. It's kind of like just a bunch of meme type cartoons. This alien comes to Earth. He's told to find the humans and talk to the humans. He never talks to any humans. He just talks to like trees and animals and stars and dirt and nothing. He talks to nothing. He never talks to any humans. He thinks he has though. Um, and they all just say stuff about what they're hoping for and how they're experiencing life. So I think what I've seen from reviews, you will either find this super enjoyable and relatable and just feel like it's expressing thoughts from your soul and you'll find it hilarious, or you'll totally be like, what is the point of this? I don't get it. I fall on the side of, I just really love it. I find it really comforting and fun and hilarious. And I really enjoyed rereading it. So for me, it was perfect, but will you like it? Who knows? Um, but it is also a really quick read, so you may as well try it. Then I picked up The Dream Factory by Steph Madiku. This is another just really short little kids story by a New Zealand Maori author. So in this, we have this dream factory that makes dreams for people. The art is really beautiful, um, especially when it shows people's dreams. However, then this naughty kereru, which is like a New Zealand wood pigeon, comes in, accidentally breaks the dream factory, and everything gets ruined. Um, I just thought this was really beautiful and cute, but also had some lovely messages in it, so I would highly recommend it. But if you don't live in New Zealand, you'll probably find it really hard to get your hands on, so sorry about that. Too bad, I guess. So, if I'm putting these three books up against each other, uh, because I don't let rereads win the battle, I'm not going to put Everyone's an Alien through, but I think I would still probably pick The Dream Factory as my favourite, just because the art's so beautiful and I really liked the message of it. Okay, so now let's try and do some kind of semi-final type thing to prepare for the final battle. Firstly, let's put the three proper full novels up against each other. So we've got Renegade's Magic by Robin Hobb, up against When Amongst Crows by Veronica Roth, up against Tidal Creatures by Shona Maguire. So I think obviously first we're going to take away Tidal Creatures because I didn't really like that anyway. Then we've got Renegade's Magic up against When Amongst Crows. And the, I think the only reason I'm really pondering this is because I feel like I always let Robin Hobb win these, and then I feel like when I do my final book battle to pick the best book of the year, there's too many Robin Hobbs. Although, is that possible to really have too many Robin Hobbs? Probably not. And, like, I love Renegade's Magic. The only thing, the very ending, I just wish it had been a little bit different. And it's so hard because Renegade's Magic, where did I put it? Like, it's such a big, thick story, whereas When Amongst Crows, even though I read it on ebook form so I don't have a, a sense of how thick it was. I don't think it was very long. So like When Amongst Crows had less chances to do things wrong. However, as I said, I found the action scenes hard to follow and I actually wish there had just been a bit more time spent in When Amongst Crows like developing the characters. Whereas this of course had plenty of character development. That's what Robin Hogg is really amazing at. So I think actually we're gonna pick Renegade's Magic to win this battle and put it through to the finals. Uh, then I guess we're doing a bit of a graphic battle. So we're going to have Far Sector by N.K. Jemisin up against The Dream Factory by Steph Matiku. 
<sighs> and this is one of these battles where the books are just doing like such different things so it's really hard to compare them and maybe it's that thing I was talking about before where shorter books have less chance of doing things wrong but I just this is kind of like a flawless little children's book and also just so beautiful so I think I think I'm gonna pick the dream factory so then that means we're up to the final and I it's worked out to be the two books that I have physically here. So it's going to be Renegade's Magic up against The Dream Factory by Steph Mataku. And once again, I'm thinking I shouldn't pick Robin Hobb. It's too obvious an answer, but I think we're going to pick Robin Hobb. So we're going to pick Renegade's Magic as the best book of the month. Did the other two books in this series also end up as best books of the month? I can't quite remember, but I really love this. And I think if you've read The Realm of the Elderlings and you're wishing you had some more Robin Hobb to read, even though this has a lower average rating on Goodreads, don't let that put you off. I think it's still worth a go. So that was all the books that I read in the month of June. Uh, let me know if you've read any of these books because I would love to chat with you about them down in the comments. Otherwise, let me know what you read in June and what your best book of the month was. Do subscribe if you'd like to see more of my bookish videos. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you are doing well and I will see you next time. Thank you.